Hi everyone, so we're going to get started with our second session. Sorry. <laughs> um, and this session is really meant to be complementary to the last one. So in the last session, we were exploring government hacking developments primarily from the perspective of civil society organizations. And we had about nine organizations represented talking about um, developments across over a half a dozen jurisdictions and some of the work that they've been doing um, as civil society organizations in terms of addressing these developments. So we're going to shift the perspective slightly and we want to talk a little bit more about what um, I, I, really two things here. The first is talking about sort of emerging regulatory efforts um, that intersect or relate to hacking primarily in Europe and then also talk a little bit more about um, the security implications of hacking from sort of a cybersecurity perspective. So we have three speakers here. Um, we're going to just go down the line, and I'm going to just do a brief introduction for all three. And then they're each going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll just open the floor for any questions that you might have. Um, so Ralph uh, Bendrad is a senior policy advisor to Jan Philip Albrecht, member of the European Parliament and Ralph works primarily on data protection reform. He has a background studying security policy, information warfare, and various aspects of internet privacy. Ralph was a civil society member of the German delegation to the UN World Summits on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005. He's a graduate in political science from the Free University of Berlin, and he's also worked at the University of Bremen, Columbia University, George Washington University, and the Technical University of Delft. Our next speaker is Uri Seifert. He works on EU data protection law as part of the data protection unit of um, DG Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. He's been closely involved in the process of drafting and negotiating the new EU data protection legislation, particularly focusing on the directive for police and criminal justice authorities. He's also in charge of the revision of data protection rules for EU institutions and bodies. And previously, he was a case processing lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights and worked for the European Parliament. Uh, Rafael Vino is a security researcher at the Computer Incident Response Center, um, and he's been there since 2012. It's based in Luxembourg. Um, Rafael wants to increase the IT consciousness of the human beings populating the internet in order to make it safer for everyone. His day job is a mixture of forensic and malware analysis with a lot of Python on top of it to glue all the pieces together. He loves sharing and thinks everyone should contribute to open source projects. Um, so we're going to kick it off with Ralph. <coughs> yeah. Um, actually, my boss uh, recently decided that he finds American job titles so funny, so I am now allowed to officially call myself Senior Policy Director. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, my colleague, our former head of office, can now call herself chief of staff. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, I thought I'd just walk you through a few uh, relevant uh, positionings of the European Parliament uh, from the last couple of years on this whole area of um, hacking, government hacking, cyber security, cyber crime and so on and, and see what we can learn from that development so to speak. And then in the end I will try to, to put that together and focus on three, or, yeah, three elements mainly. So um, the major discussion of course not only in the European Parliament on government hacking and so on started with the Snowden revelations. Uh, we did a special inquiry back then, 2013-14, which ended with a big, fat resolution. And some of the paragraphs here, so I'll just do some poetry slam. I'll just read this out and <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, maybe take notes which ones are more funny or more relevant. Um, paragraph 65 in that resolution on Snowden says, uh, the parliament reiterates a serious, its serious concern um, regarding, among other things, uh, direct remote access to personal data and information by third country law enforcement authorities and intelligence services. Serious concern. Um, next one in that resolution is the European Parliament strongly condemns the fact that intelligence services sought to lower IT security standards and to install backdoors in a wide range of IT systems, asks the Commission 
to present draft legislation to ban the use of back doors by law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what I found really uh, good, I forgot if it came from us or from some other groups, but uh, it's quite interesting, um, takes the view that while legitimate law enforcement and intelligence concerns need to be taken into account in order to support the fight against terrorism, they should not lead to a general undermining of the dependability of all IT systems and then expresses support for the recent decisions by the en Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, to include governments in the threat model for internet security. That was quite a step. Um, and then there was one paragraph, um, which I just mentioned here, but I'll come back to that later on so-called e-evidence, um, access to electronic evidence, um, stresses its serious concerns in relation with the work within the Council of Europe's Cybercrime Convention Committee, um, and so on, which might undermine the principle of territoriality, and so on. Um, uh, could result in unfettered remote access by law enforcement authorities to servers and computers located in other jurisdictions without recourse to mutual legal assistance agreements and other instruments of judicial cooperation. So uh, already back then we were monitoring what's uh, cooking in the Council of Europe. It was called, I think in the Council of Europe they call it cloud evidence. Uh, in Brussels it's now called e-evidence. Um, okay, next one was then actually not a position of the Parliament, but a study done for the European Parliament uh, on legal frameworks for hacking by law enforcement, identification, evaluation, and comparison of practices. Quite an interesting read. They also did an overview of uh, how the situation is in a number of countries. But this is like a typical study done for the European Parliament, which uh, basically nobody ever reads, <laughs> or only the real nerds, and most of us working there don't have the time for that. And they come up with recommendations, uh, which are, yeah, well, the European Parliament could adopt a resolution calling on the Commission to do this, or on the Member States to do that. And then there's funny things like, um, the European Parliament should call on the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights to develop a practitioner handbook related to the governing of hacking by law enforcement. Yes, <laughs> not really. <laughs> the FRA is the least competent uh, agency for that, I guess. <laughs> um, but then more interesting was uh, last October, I think. Yes, 3rd October 2017, a resolution on the fight against cybercrime which started out as a proposal by the Conservatives and we were afraid that it would become, a, would become a big Christmas tree with child sexual abuse and hate speech and everything, you know, people are just putting everything on it they ever thought about. But in the end we managed to get quite a good text. It's still very long and, and still kind of Christmas tree, but there are some very interesting elements in here. For example, the Parliament underlines that the fight against cybercrime should be first and foremost about safeguarding and hardening critical infrastructures and other network devices, and not only about pursuing repressive measures. And I'll come, come back to that later in the conclusions. Um, then um, the Parliament acknowledges that technological advances on encryption will improve the overall security of our information systems, which also by implication means uh, backdoors maybe are not a good idea. <coughs> then, uh, maybe I skip a few. On IoT security, the Parliament reiterates uh, that producers or manufacturers, if you want, are the key starting point for tightening up liability regimes, which will lead to a better quality of products and a more secure environment in terms of external access and a documented update facility. So this whole resolution puts a very strong emphasis on if you want to be serious about fighting and preventing cyber crime, uh, cyber attacks against information systems, you have to set the right incentives for manufacturers and operators to really harden their systems. Mm -hmm. And maybe police work, investigation, maybe lawful hacking and so on only comes later. The, the first line of attack, so to speak, would be to harden the systems. Um, and then another good one, 
urges the member states not to impose any obligation on encryption providers that would result in the weakening or compromising of the security of their networks or ser services, such as the creation of fa or faci facilitation of backdoors, um, stresses uh, that lawful interception can be a highly effective measure to combat unlawful hacking on condition that it is necessary proportionate, based on due legal process and in full compliance with fundamental rights and EU data protection law and case law, calls on all member states to make use of the possibilities of lawful interception targeting suspected individuals, not mass blanket surveillance, ta targeted, um, um, to establish clear rules regarding the prior judicial authorization process for lawful interception activities including restrictions on the use and duration of lawful hacking tools to set up an oversight mechanism and to provide effective legal remedies for the targets of hack hacking activities. So the parliament doesn't call on the member states to start legal hacking by law enforcement authorities, it just says, but, uh, in a way it says, uh, if you do that, you need to have proper rules and safeguards and procedures. Um, and then another one, of course, inspired by the WannaCry incident, um, stresses the need to minimize the risks posed to the privacy of Internet users by leaks of exploits or tools used by law enforcement authorities as part of their legitimate investigations. That, of course, refers to the fact that the exploits used in WannaCry were leaked by the shadow brokers and originally came from the NSA. Um, Then in paragraph 61, it, the parliament calls on, um, uh, or believes that uh, in the long term, shared procedural standards on enforcement jurisdiction in cyberspace should also be developed at a global level. So we need common standards if you want to do mutual recognition and things like that. Um, on e-evidence, there's two elements, and I'm really curious to hear later what uh, you, Roy, can tell us about the ongoing work in the Commission on e-evidence. Um, in, in paragraph 64, the Parliament basically says, within the EU, uh, we should um, maybe have rules on uh, access to electronic evidence, but uh, this needs to be based on due legal process and in line with the European investigation order um, and some other criteria. Uh, and if you go beyond the EU, it's even more complicated uh, because um, is that? Yeah. Um, that yeah, the Parliament highlights the need to ensure that any legal framework protects providers and all other parties from requests that could create conflicts of law or otherwise impinge on the sovereignty of <coughs> other states. This, in a way, also relates to the ongoing co uh, case at the US Supreme Court. You probably all know Microsoft Ireland, uh, where, among others, uh, we, uh, together with some other MEPs uh, last week, also submitted an amicus brief, which is exactly about this uh, conflict of law problem. And then the last one from this here, again on e-evidence, the Parliament stresses its serious concern regarding the work being done within the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention Committee uh, and so on, on trans-border access to stored computer data, quote unquote cloud evidence and opposes any conclusion of an additional protocol or guidance intended to broaden the scope of this provision beyond the current regime established by this convention, and so on, um, without recourse to mutual legal assistance agreements. So you already see this is not so much about hacking in the strict sense, but uh, more about what should the law enforcement authorities in general be able to do, and especially internationally. Um, then also in October, the Parliament adopted its position on the e-privacy reform, on the protection of electronic communications. And there we basically introduced uh, a new paragraph in Article 17 on security, which basically says, uh, providers of electronic communication service, information society services, and manufacturers of software permitting 
access to the internet basically, shall not use any means, no matter if technical, operational, or by terms of use or by contracts, mm -hmm. that could prevent users and subscribers from applying the best available techniques against intrusions and interceptions and to secure their networks, terminal equipment, and electronic communications. And then breaking, decrypting, restricting, or circumventing such measure taken by users or subscribers shall be prohibited. And then we also have uh, some obligations now on if there's law, law enforcement access to internet access providers or communication providers, uh, that they now have to do proper reporting, so providers and the uh, authorities. So this gives you a short summary, I would say, of the discussions uh, going on over the last year. Some of this is contradictory. Uh, if you look closer at the Snowden inquiry report and then at the latest cybercrime uh, resolution, you will see that uh, the parliament tends to forget easily. The Snowden report was adopted in the last legislative term. Um, but still, I think that the discussion about this is kind of converging in a, in a corridor um, where we also, also if you look at um, areas beyond the parliament, uh, last year in March, I think, um, where's Lucy? She knows better, Lucy is not here anymore. Um, <coughs> there was a joint uh, declaration by the directors of Europol and ELISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency, where they already said, we think the, that uh, obliging uh, providers to um, put backdoors into encryption is not a good idea, because it would make all of us unsecure. Um, so in a way, this crypto backdoor debate is kind of, I would say, or hope, uh, over. Um, mandatory backdoors for crypto. Um, also this uh, paper that came out last year by Bruce Schneier and Oren Kerr on how can you deal with encrypted communication and data without putting backdoors uh, was, as far as I heard, very um, well received also in the council working group and also maybe you know more. Um, but now the uh, state of play is basically we have uh, crypto, maybe without backdoors, but we still, as law enforcement officers, want to get to the communication. How do we deal with that? And then the obvious answer is, of course, hacking. You um, try to get into the device to get the communication before it gets encrypted. That's what they call in German the source uh, interception. They, they want to intercept it at the source, but that already means you have to place a Trojan on the device. Um, but that's in a way, in Germany, Fukami would also know more about that. Um, in Germany, we have this distinction between this source interception, where you hack into the device, but just to intercept the encryption, bef uh, the communication before it's encrypted, and then the full Trojan, so to speak, which scans the hard drive and the whole memory of the computer and gets basically everything, uh, which is, you could argue, more intrusive. Um, and then, of course, the discussion you have very often is, okay, this is a new investigation method for law enforcement authorities. What kind of safeguards and limits and whatever oversight do we need? And this is basically a very old debate already. Um, this, in a way, links to the general debates we've had over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years on electronic communications and interception and surveillance. Um, there's the 13 principles developed by civil society a few years ago. The European Data Protection Supervisor, I think, last year, two years ago, uh, presented a paper on how to, in a way, measure and check a checklist or something, a toolbox for, for assessing the pr proportionality and necessity of such measures. Um, Joe Kanatachi is currently working on, on a proposal like on this. Um, so this is all interesting, um, but I think what's missing here if we talk about hacking is uh, what already was touched on a bit in the previous panel, the security aspect of that. And this is what the Parliament resolution on cybercrime uh, is very good on. Um, normally, and this is by the way also referred to in this Parliament study, which I found funny and interesting, normally you have this uh, framing of privacy versus security. You know, if you have more privacy, stronger privacy protection, law enforcement, police officers can't do their job, so you have less security, which I always find wrong, but 
And the Parliament, even in 2009 already, in its resolution on the Stockholm program, adopted a clarification on that. Um, that was my first success back then. <laughs> but now, um, what's interesting is that you have a discussion of security versus cyber security. So uh, you have to basically choose which kind of security you want to enhance. The security uh, you get by more effective law enforcement, more effective criminal investigations and so on, or the security you get by hardening the devices, uh, putting proper update mechanisms in place and, and setting the right incentives and liabilities for manufacturers of electronic uh, devices and software and so on to, to really make their, their systems secure. And this uh, last part, the cyber security part of that is, I think, becoming more and more pressing, especially with the Internet of Things. Uh, now people are really understanding that uh, it's one thing if somebody hacks into my phone or my computer and maybe listens to what I'm doing there or, or looks at my screen. Okay, that's surveillance. Nothing is really happening. But if somebody hacks into my car, or my heating control system, or maybe a SCADA system for industrial controls, people can die, you know, and that's why it's much more important to, to really enhance the cybersecurity and harden the systems, basically, but that, of course, is in a way at odds with, um, with government hacking also and lawful hacking. So now we have this debate about, and, and also triggered by shadow brokers again, um, maybe it's too risky for us as society as a whole to um, let law enforcement and intelligence agencies hoard zero days and, and backdoor vulnerabilities without notifying the manufacturers <coughs> just in case they could uh, need them one day in a specific investigation. Maybe it's better for society as a whole to inform the manufacturers and have proper, quick, effective, really functioning update uh, and, and security mechanisms in place. So, but even this, in a way, is, you could say, not a very new debate. It's just that policymakers here in Brussels are, not the less techy ones are understanding this now better with the Internet of Things. Um, what I find interesting is the, the um, and again, I'm really curious to hear about the evidence, uh, this uh, conflict of law issue. Because um, and Ton and uh, I think Felix also in the previous panel referred to their national laws in the Netherlands and France, where authorities are now allowed to hack into computers in third countries. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Um, as I said, we are just fighting together with Microsoft and a whole load of others, industry and civil society and academics, uh, against the access of uh, the FBI to data stored in Ireland, direct access, uh, because there's mutual legal assistance agreements, and that should be the proper way to do it. Um, so this is about access to data in the sense that uh, a company is approached by police, and, and Microsoft is told, give us the data, which is one thing, but of course it gets more, even more worrying if the FBI, for example, must not even, or doesn't have to, to ask Microsoft, but can just directly hack into their servers. I mean, and then we run into all the problems Fukami mentioned with uh, proper oversight and, and uh, auditing and what have you. Um, but I think also, even if we would do that, uh, such a thing just within the EU, where we already have the European investigation order and certain minimum standards for procedural rights in criminal investigations, um, I would still prefer the, the kind of old school uh, way uh, the investigation order and the classical MLATs are doing that a police authority in one country that's doing the investigation contacts their colleagues in the other one and then they do the enforcement and the getting access to the evidence there. Because otherwise you as a victim kind of, uh, of such a police um, access request or hacking attempt uh, you can't really go to the country where the police comes from and, and go to court against them. I mean, uh, it should be the authorities in your country. Um, but this is really where everybody is now looking at you guys to see why was e-evidence postponed? Will it, I uh, probably it won't consider, uh, won't contain hacking. That was the original thinking in the Council of Europe a couple of years back. But still, um, yeah, we're curious. 
Um, thank you, Ralph. I just wanted to make one note, which is I, th I believe that the hacking powers in the UK under the Investigatory Powers Act also authorize extraterritorial hacking. Mm -hmm. um, and then the issue of extraterritoriality is quite, um, it's a quite potent one in the hacking context because often hacking is used as a way to decloak um, or identify users that are um, using various security or privacy measures um, to hide their location. Mm -hmm. So um, I mentioned this in the last session, but in the US we filed a series of amicus briefs um, in relation to an operation that the FBI conducted where they ended up um, <laughs> using a watering hole attack on a hidden, um, Tor Hidden Onion service. Um, and they ended up affecting over 8,700 devices that were located, 83% of which were located not in the US in over 100 different countries. Um, and so there, you know, when we're talking about Microsoft Ireland, we're talking about basically one instance of a potential conflict of law. And here we're talking about a whole different scale mm -hmm. in terms of sovereignty issues and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, I just wonder if, if companies, uh, countries like the UK, Netherlands, France, and probably others uh, have these, uh, give their law enforcement authorities these competences, that means they can also hack servers in other EU member states. How does that fit in the principle of uh, sincere cooperation among EU member states? I just don't get it. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> if you take the example of Belgium, who has GCHQ, NSA, compromising Belgium, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, that's uh, one reason to kick out the British. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, our next speaker, here I. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I need to make the, the usual disclaimer in the beginning, you know, some basic and in the speaking game, uh, meaning that uh, what I say, I say in my official in my, in not in my official capacity, <laughs> but in my, in my personal capacity, and I don't represent the, the Commission view here or the Commission position. And I see that you are extremely curious to learn about what's happening with the evidence and why it's not going to be published tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll say what I can, but only in the end of my presentation. So we can have a beer afterwards. <laughs> and over the beer, I can tell you even more. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, well, I think I, I was asked by, by Scarlett to, to represent the regulatory framework for this lawful hacking, government hacking, however you call it. Uh, I think what we see in, in, in recent years, at least at the EU level, which I know, is a sort of this, this clash between the, let's say, law enforcement community and the fundamental rights data protection privacy community uh, on, on how to deal with this, how to tackle with this, how to tackle this problem. Um, because from the law enforcement community, uh, they, they come from a very, very basic uh, position saying that there is so much data being generated out there and it can help us in our work, so we should get access to it. In particular, the prosecutors are the most aggressive ones. I think if, if we, we distinguish the law enforcement community into police, prosecutors, and judges, I think the prosecutors are the ones who really are pushing hard for, yeah. for having access to and getting, you know, there is so much things out there and we need to get it. And uh, uh, for, I have a basic problem with that because uh, uh, just because there is more data being generated out there, it doesn't mean that it needs to be accessible for the law enforcement community. And in, in that sense, uh, I always return to, to the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights from 2010, uh, Gefgen versus Germany. It's a grand chamber judgment. It's about Article 3, so it's prohibition of torture. It's about uh, how you are, even if you are in a position to maybe save a, a child from a monstrous killer, you're still not allowed to beat, beat up the suspect in order to get um, the evidence or to save that, that person. Um, and uh, that judgment has a, a little obit of dictum on, on Article 8, actually, when judgment is in Article 3. But uh, in paragraph 165, it says, the court reiterates that the question whether the use as evidence of information obtained in violation of Article 8 rendered a trial as a whole unfair, contrary to Article 6, has to be determined with regard to all the circumstances of the case, including respect for the applicant's defense rights and the quality and importance of the evidence in question. 
So basically it's saying that if you obtain evidence by violating pr uh, privacy <coughs> rights under Article 8, you can actually then violate the entire fairness of the trial. And I think it basically, the, then the, 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 the underlining message there is that it, it cannot be easy for law enforcement authorities to, to gather evidence because then it will be subject to abuse. So it always has to be difficult, it has to be, it cannot be the easiest, the most straightforward way uh, get to gathering evidence uh, that will actually ensure the defense rights and the fair trial uh, in the end. And I think that that's something very important that uh, that is often gets forgotten. Uh, that's my introductory remark. And then I, I would like to, when we speak about regulatory framework, I think we need to distinguish between uh, hacking by, at least at the EU level, we have to distinguish between hacking by law enforcement authorities and hacking by surveillance or hacking by secret services. Because for the law enforcement authorities, we have a, a full set of data protection rules which they need to respect when they process personal data, including the data they, they would eventually hack from somewhere, because we now have the data protection directive for police and criminal justice authorities that has to be transposed by 6th of May uh, this year by 28 member states and, and four Schengen states. So, uh, and I will speak a little bit more about the directive later, but uh, what about the intelligence services, the secret services. Because in principle, they are out of scope of EU law, so we cannot regulate what they, what they do. Uh, you have, of course, national laws, you have some, or, or all, all member states are uh, parties to the Convention 108, so they need to respect rules of Convention 108 when it comes to secret services. Have European Court of Human Rights judgments, uh, Roman Zakharov, Lishi and Saab, blah, 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 so there is a lot of things there, but under EU law, it's not our domain, actually. Uh, but I think, and this is where your work on e-privacy regulation is very important, and the work that you have already done on the GDPR is crucial. I think we need to distinguish between processing of data, personal data for national security purposes, as we, can reg we can't regulate, and on the other hand, restrictions that are imposed on data subject rights for reasons of national security. Because those you will find under the GDPR, Article 23, under the privacy regulation, Article 11, so under the old the privacy directive, Article 15, right? So then we have to look at the EU law, and uh, this is where I found uh, some very inspiring uh, provision of paragraphs in the in the Tele2 judgment uh, of last year on, on uh, data retention, because it speaks about these restrictions under the e-privacy directive. And if you look at the paragraph 75, 76, <coughs> then speaks about what is covered, what is not covered by the scope of that directive because of that Article 15 on restrictions. And they say, legislative measures requiring providers to retain traffic and location data involve processing of such data by service providers and therefore fall within the scope of the directive, okay? But I also say the scope extends to a legislative measure about access of national authorities to the data retained by the providers. So my reading, uh, this is really my personal reading of, of these two paragraphs and what does it mean actually in practice? It means for me that uh, a national legislative measure that requires the service provider to restrict some data subject rights in a certain way, for example, by retaining data like in e-privacy or by enabling access to authorities without informing the data subject to their uh, data or carrying out some sort of profiling that would be uh, creating some profiles that would be used by the authorities later on. Things like that would fall under the scope of those restrictions in Article 23 GDPR or Article 11 of the future e-privacy regulation. And then all the requirements stemming from that, that it has to, this measure has to be necessary, proportionate in a democratic society, that it has to respect the essence of the right, that it cannot violate the basic principles of data protection. Uh, it attracts then the, the sort of the um, authority of both Article 7 and Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So you have 
all the EU full Monty there in that case. And uh, uh, I'm, I, so in any case, uh, what, uh, whatever providers do, that's definitely covered, but uh, uh, from stemming from Article uh, Paragraph 76 of Tele2 Judgment, I would argue that it's also applicable to the way uh, the service providers have to enable access to the data by authorities. And for me, then it's completely relevant whether these authorities are law enforcement authorities or um, national intelligence services. Uh, and then what they do after that, after they get the access, that's out of scope of EU law for me. So uh, what, what the secret services will actually, how they will process that data once they access it, that we can't regulate anymore. But I think the first part is very important because that's where the lawful hacking occurs or at least begins in this sphere. And, and we see now in many national laws where in many countries, many EU member states are now revising their um, intelligence agency legislation or national security legislation, whatever. And we see in, the, in those proposals, in those new texts that there is a lot of requirements imposed on service providers where they are asked to give this type of access, that type of access to secret <laughs> services, enable this, enable that. And uh, I think it's, it, will, it is very difficult to argue that this is completely out of scope of EU law because it's about national security, it's about what the intelligence agencies do. And it's not only about that, it's also about what the service providers have to do in respect of them. Um, so that's, that, that's the part on the secret services, but where we have full regulation, and now I'm coming back to, to the directive 2016-680, is what the law enforcement authorities uh, have to do and how they can do hacking, let's say. Uh, well, the directive itself has a number of safeguards that, are, that you have identified under your 10 um, uh, safeguards as Privacy International, but also uh, some others have, and Ralph has mentioned some of them already. For example, if you are a subject to uh, a measure of covert surveillance, you need to be notified about it as soon, individually notified about it as soon as the reasons for that uh, are, are finished. So if, you, if data was gathered about you without your knowledge, you need to be notified about it. So we have a clear notification obligation. Then we have um, obviously the oversight of the data protection authorities with all the uh, requirements of, of their independence and so on of the law enforcement authorities. Um, but also we have something that you don't have in the GDPR. Uh, we have indirect exercise of data subject rights. So uh, in case uh, there is uh, some data subject rights have been restricted for legitimate reasons, uh, right of access, the usual one, but it could, could also be uh, er right of erasure, uh, rectification, and uh, the right of individual information, so the notification obligation, you can still go to the Data Protection Authority and say, uh, listen, I think they are doing something with me. Uh, I'm not really sure because they restricted all the information, so they just tell me uh, we can either confirm or deny we are processing your personal data. So I don't Which really know. they do. So, <laughs> yeah, so I don't really know what, whether they do something and if they do something, whether it's lawful or not. So please, can you check on my behalf? And then the Data Protection Authority can do all the, all the checks and see whether the processing is lawful, whether data subject rights have been respected, whether uh, there should have been, data should have been erased. Uh, and, and it hasn't been so, and then it, of course, can use its corrective powers. So there is this this element which actually was inspired by the requirements of uh, a judgment of the ECHR in the in a surveillance case, which was uh, Roman Zaharov versus Russia, where they say, okay, you don't need to know that you are a subject of surveillance, but there needs to be some sort of mechanism that uh, looks at it. So uh, that is, I think. Uh, uh, of uh, quite an important achievement of the directive. Also, the fact that you could impose administrative fines on law enforcement authorities if you want. There are some member states who, already a lot of member states who are doing exactly that. So basically taking the administrative fines from the GDPR and applying them also to the area covered by the directive. Uh, 
Then there are very strict logging requirements that should basically prevent uh, abuse by individual law enforcement officers and so on. So there are, there are a number of things over there that are, that are helpful in this context of, of government hacking. Uh, then, um, so that, that is the situation at the EU level, but then we have something on the international level, and you already mentioned it, that, is, that has a potential, in my view, to undermine a number of efforts that were achieved uh, by the data protection reform, which is the Cybercrime Convention of the Council of Europe. In or, in, to be more precise, Article 32 of the Cybercrime Convention on unilateral transborder searches. Because mm -hmm. other mechanisms in, the conven in Cybercrime Conventions are at least mutual recognition. So at least, I s it, it's not mutual legal assistance, but at least it's mutual like, recognition. So I, I want to do something when, so I'm, I don't know, Belgian law enforcement authority, I want to I wanna do something in the US, and at least the US law enforcement authority has to validate what I want to do. But in Article 30 32, there is not even that. There is no one in the other jurisdiction gets informed or needs to authorize my actions. So it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very, I think, uh, well, dangerous article in a way. Uh, well, I would like to say generally that Cybercrime Convention is a, an open convention of the Council of Europe. There are 43 uh, out of 47 Council of Europe member states that are ratified it. There are two EU, EU states that haven't ratified it. It's Ireland and Sweden. And then Russia and San Marino also haven't ratified it. But then there are so a lot of others who have ratified it because we have overall 56 states. So we have, but it's interesting who is there. USA is there, Canada is there, Israel is there, <laughs> Australia is there, Japan is there, and then we have few South American countries like Chile, and, uh, and uh, there are some African countries, uh, uh, and that, that brings us to the total of 56. So this is the first and, and most significant multilateral binding instrument to regulate cybercrime, but it's not only that, it's also, it also embraces investigatory measures that concern the collection of evidence in electronic form. And uh, it's basically about any form of offense where such electronic evidence might be relevant. So it, it's about also what is called nowadays cyber-enabled crime, not only about cyber crime. And this is where Article 32 comes into play, because um, the authorities of one country go transborder without authorization or knowledge of the other party, uh, then they can access two things. They can, un under this article, one is publicly available data. Then we can enter into this uh, also very long debate between US and, uh, and the EU e and Europe, what is publicly available data. Uh, so that's not very, that's not crystal clear between the different signatories of this convention. But actually more importantly, and this is wh where I want to put more emphasis is, data that are being obtained through after the lawful and voluntary consent of the person who has the lawful authority to disclose the data. So in order to go in a unilateral transborder access, I will repeat, you have to get a lawful and voluntary consent of the person who has the lawful authority to disclose the data. Uh, who is that person? So that is, <laughs> that is the problem. What does it mean? Who gives the consent here? What kind of consent is that? Uh, basically for, for direct searches, by getting someone's device and start looking into his or her data storing the cloud through a device, or by simply hacking someone's device, wh what you were mentioning before. Uh, who, who, who would give this consent? And is there such a thing as a law, as a, as a consent in this law enforcement context? Because under EU law, no, we explicitly say no. Our data protection rules say that you cannot give uh, freely given consent to someone who has coercive power over you. So uh, uh, that's why, for example, in the directive that I mentioned, the consent is not legal basis. It doesn't exist. You have it in the GDPR, but in the, in the directive, we only have law as legal basis. We don't have consent because we, we think that consent in this context cannot be freely given. And yet this 
is uh, obvious the law enforcement convention speaking about some side, some sort of a consent. So that's the first problem that, that we have with this. The second one is the who who is the entity giving the consent? Because this is a very ambiguous wording, uh, lawful authority to disclose the data. You could argue that it is the service provider that could have the authority to tell the law enforcement authorities, yes, you can hack my customer data, so go ahead. And, uh, and uh, so it's not, I mean, who would give consent? Why would I, if I'm a suspect, I wouldn't give a consent anyway that someone hacks my data. So uh, this is, this is why, where this whole thing gets, uh, gets very problematic. And then on top of that, the, the Cybercrime Convention has insufficient fundamental rights safeguards and the signatories of the Cybercrime Convention are not the same as for the Convention 108. <coughs> And uh, here, actually, I come to, to my conclusion. The thing is that, why was I speaking so much about the Cybercrime Convention? Because, first of all, it's being amended right now. There is, a, there is work ongoing on the second additional protocol. Uh, ob obviously, all the EU member states, but much more than EU, is involved in this. You heard who, who is the signatory, and uh, I'm afraid that <coughs> this amendment will go actually into even broader uh, powers or even, even more problematic uh, provisions uh, uh, than the, the dimensioned Article 32. Uh, and what would be crucial from our point of view uh, as uh, EU lawmakers is to actually take it into a different direction to make sure that the Cybercrime Convention is uh, brought in line with the standards of the data protection reform that we just adopted. So this question of consent is obviously the burning one. Uh, and then uh, standards of how to restrict data subject rights uh, are also problematic and it could be ensured by insisting that uh, at the minimum the ones who are signatories to the Cybercrime Convention have to also adhere to, to the revised Convention 108. Uh, so probably that's that's daydreaming, but um, I think that would be the right way to to, to do to do things uh, over there in Strasbourg. And uh, finally, uh, the last thing I want to say is about your favorite topic, e-evidence. Uh, all these things um, that that uh, were mentioned, I mean, they are part of the reflection process on the. Uh, European legislation on cross-border ac access to electronic evidence that will be presented this year. Uh, the Commission will, will have a proposal. I, I'm not in charge of that, so that first I have to say that. <coughs> and uh, there is a big push to legislate on, uh, on the cross-border uh, access to electronic evidence and, and from two points of view, I think, or in two instances, and both are inspired by the said cybercrime convention. Uh, and this is what we have seen in the reflection papers in the stakeholder process, which was quite open, I have to say, uh, so everyone could participate and see what people are thinking about what could be in that, in that legislative uh, uh, proposal. Uh, one part of, uh, and uh, where the most emphasis was put on, was actually inspired by Article 18 of the Cybercrime Convention, which I didn't speak about, which is instead of going through mutual legal assistance or mutual recognition, you go directly to the service provider, cross-border, and you say, I need subscriber information behind this IP address. Or in the more intrusive scenario, I need uh, uh, traffic and metadata of this user. Uh, or in the even the worst uh, or the most most intrusive scenario, I need the content of uh, email messages of this user or your user. <coughs> and then uh, the service provider would have to reply to this uh, directly without addressing, without his own law enforcement authorities of his own country where the seed is or where the data is stored getting involved. So that was one, uh, one aspect of the initiative, and that I don't think that would be considered as government hacking. But uh, the, the other part that was being reflected upon was actually 
again inspired by this article 32 of the Cybercrime Convention, which is more about this how to actually do a dar uh, an open search or a remote search of a device. And, uh, and so the initiative was twofold, uh, at the level of reflections. But as you know, the proposal should have been published uh, tomorrow and it's been delayed. So obviously uh, there was a lot of things that are not mature yet or not ripe yet. So uh, internally, I think we still need to reflect a lot about a number of things. Uh, and uh, I really, honestly, I don't know what, what will be in the end proposal and uh, what, what, what are the elements that I presented here that will be there and what are the elements that won't be there. I can just tell you what has been reflected upon, but uh, since the whole process is delayed, um, yeah, obviously the the initiative is still far from being uh, being ready. Yeah, so that's that's what I can say on that. Um, anyway, so uh, what I what my my main point is actually that whatever comes in the future, be it at the EU level, at the national level, or at the international level, like the Cybercrime Convention. What we need to make sure as, uh, as policy makers is that it respects the standards and the achievements of the data protection reform. And that will be our biggest struggle in the, in the next years because there are a lot of initiatives that are not doing that. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, w I would end on that note. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Rafael. So, first of all, who have you <coughs> served already in the past? Like CERT or NC? Okay, so I'm going to explain a bit what, what a CERT is. So a CERT is a computer emergency response team, meaning that it's a team that will investigate uh, like information security incidents and uh, give a report generally to the, to the victim. There are many different kinds of CERTs uh, in Europe and all over the world. Most of the ones, most of the like Eastern European, uh, Western European um, CERTs are partially funded by the government, or completely funded by the government, and they are what we call blue team, meaning they don't do any attacks on anything, they only investigate cases. Um, you can have a third that is purely governmental, meaning their uh, constituency will be government on generally critical infrastructures. Um, you have third that, like, similar to the one I'm actually part of in Luxembourg, who is more private sector. So our constituency will be uh, private companies, NGOs, and the communes in Luxembourg. Uh, and then you have all kind of um, internal company certs, uh, like Airbus, like Airbus, Siemens, and so on. We have, so big companies will have certs um, who will take care of their own uh, systems. And then you have companies providing security services to, um, to like, the selling services to other companies. Um, so, what we will see generally, and I'm mostly going to talk about what I see nowadays in, uh, in Luxembourg, is uh, generally we start with like an incident, so something we have happened, and a company who doesn't necessarily have um, like a way to investigate will come to us and be like, so that weird thing happened, and I have that binary, or someone clicked on that link, and can you please help us to figure out what happened? Uh, and then get back to work as fast as possible because sometimes it can be like really big. Uh, so, and we also take care of uh, more global incidents. As we mentioned earlier, WannaCry or Herbleed. And when we have those kind of incidents, we end up in a situation where um, some people knew about that kind of vulnerability or knew about that kind of problem and didn't necessarily do anything. And that's like one of the really big problems when you have uh, law enforcement or uh, secret service that is like aware of some vulnerability and keep it for themselves and at some point it will go public anyway. And when this one goes public, when this vulnerability ends up uh, like on the like, yeah, on computers of everyone and you have to, in to respond to that, um, whatever like all the nice ideas you had on uh, like how to, how is it, it's going to be used to compromise uh, bad people, it ends up like on everyone's computer, and everyone needs to be to find a remediation to that. 
And that's generally like one of the big uh, contention points between red team, so red team who want to attack and compromise and like just get access to some services, and blue teams who actually want to protect generally the whole infrastructure. Um, so yeah, that's like one of the really big issues that needs to be assessed at some point uh, in the in those legislations. Uh, and what happens to us when we start to investigate in the case? We never know what's actually going on. We never know like, if it's something like governmental or if it's something that is law enforcement implemented by law enforcement, or if it's just uh, some random criminal doing something. Um, and so that's why we always take we always take an incident as like something malicious from like something coming from a malicious actor, and we try to uh, help the company or the. NGO or the citizen to get back to work, um, whichever um, the whichever law enforcement could be uh, maybe behind it, and that's something that is really hard to figure out before you start investigating. So um, especially when you take cases like uh, Finn Fisher and Hacking Team, who basically have like provide packages with X amount of um, like. Compromission, the X amount of like machines that can be compromised by the, by the systems, and um, those ones, like those packages, can be bought by uh, law enforcement, secret services, private companies, uh, weird Turkish group in um, in Iraq. That happened with Fintech. Uh, so, like you have those companies are private companies selling malware. And as they sell it, not only to criminal but also to law enforcement, relatively often they end up in situations where uh, they play on both sides. And it's almost impossible for someone, like for a blue team, to figure out who is actually behind it and what, what happened. Uh, so that's one of the things <coughs> that needs to be at some point assessed also by um, by legislative body to just like how, how do we how do we deal with that? And if you get something off the shelf. Everyone gets it. So um, anyone can just put, give enough money, we just have access to that bit of thing. So at the end, you have law enforcement that are somehow supporting criminal activities by other people by just like providing money to those, those companies. Um, so yeah, I mean, I will keep it relatively short. So if you have questions already, please go for it. Uh, and if you have more questions regarding like, certain activities and so on, um, yeah, happy to answer. So, Okay, great. So um, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, we're, let's take as many questions as we can. There's a coffee break after this. So I think if you have specific questions that we aren't able to cover, like if it's okay with the speakers, maybe feel free to find them and ask them, you know, directly um, and, you know, chat with them and put them on the spot. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Uh, maybe let's take two at a time, so the two of you next to each other. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned the Cybercrime Convention. Mm -hmm. Does it also help uh, if uh, another country within the European Union, uh, like the British hack uh, a Belgian company like Belgacom? So does it apply in this case? So. Uh, it's not legal to hack Belgacom in Belgium, so they may ask for uh, legal help. <coughs> yeah, uh, thanks for all your, the things you were talking about. You spend a lot of energy to build up uh, yeah, safeguards that uh, make it more complicated for governments uh, to, yeah, to do surveillance or so, but actually, what the parliament says sometimes, a government is not interesting, they're much more straight. They're doing, normally have uh, majorities or they're doing their own laws. And uh, in Germany we now have a policy, hack back. So, hack back. Then government will, um, <coughs> yeah, hack back. Hack back, yeah. hack, hack back. They will hack back. <laughs> uh, we now, that uh, at least 50 states are building up uh, cyber armies. Um, so, yeah, what, what do you think about uh, what are your strategies against yeah. that? Yeah. I was thinking, Ralph and I maybe take the Cybercrime Convention 
and you can also address I that. Also right? address Raphael, the second I, yeah, and I also think uh, Rafael if you had some thoughts about that. Well. What you say about the Italian manual, for example, where they have written everything, uh, how they <coughs> use the existing law to uh, fight against other countries in, in the cyber war? The North Italian manual? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, well, uh, no, and a cybercrime convention, I, I don't know, the, uh, the point of that is actually to have a, well, not to fight cyber wars, or it's not about cyber security, it's about uh, in recognizing that there is certain crime which is done in the cyberspace, or, uh, it, or certain crime that is done in the regular space, but it's enabled through the cyberspace, and then how to criminalize certain behaviors in national laws and how to uh, facilitate each other's uh, basically law enforcement operations that are fighting such types of crimes. And uh, yes, Belgium and, uh, and the UK are both parties to the Cybercrime Convention, but uh, even uh, the example that you gave about Belgacom, uh, that would be in violation of the Cybercrime Convention because uh, no one asked for voluntary and lawful consent of that authority, <laughs> whatever it is, whoever it is. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, maybe UK could, uh, or maybe Belgium could uh, report to the Council of Europe that UK was violating the terms of the Cybercrime Convention, I don't know. But um, in any case, the, as I said, the Convention is about uh, those sort of law enforcement aims, and it's, it's a very, that's an interesting dynamics in the Council of Europe. It's a very sort of law enforcement community convention and then you have convention 108 which is a different type of community and uh, different signatory states and uh, a lot of clashes between the two so uh, that's on the, on the level of, uh, of uh, the Council of Europe it's an interesting dynamics I would also add uh, another interesting development is that uh, the Russians they are not party of the cybercrime convention because they want to have their own cybercrime convention under the auspices of UN. So they drafted something differently and they want to have a UN cybercrime convention, not the Council of Europe. So there is also this type of uh, clashes that are, we're going to see how this will be yeah, I think part of the problem why Belgium didn't go to court against the UK, for example, is uh, attribution. It's really hard to really finally prove that the UK GCHQ was behind the attacks on Belgacom. Um, although, as far as I know or remember from back then, uh, you really could tell that the attacks uh, stopped when the, uh, in Gr Great Britain, with one hour behind, they had their tea time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think our, our uh, approach as Greens in the European Parliament has always been like two-tiered, so to speak. Uh, on, on the more high-level political um, discussions and so on, we try to, to fight all these attempts and at, at least put proper safeguards and procedure and oversight, what have you, on. Um, <coughs> and also, yeah, fight, fight them politically. Uh, just two weeks ago, I think, the parliament adopted uh, its position on the export controls for dual use, including surveillance technology and so on. That also was a green rapporteur. Um, but on the other side, uh, as I said before, um, the underlying problem of all this is that the, our IT systems have vulnerabilities. If our IT systems were much more secured, we wouldn't have part, a large parts of this problem. So we need to set the right incentives for better IT security. And that ranges from, that then you suddenly go away from all the cyber debates and cyber war and what have you and intelligence, you just do product liability. <coughs> the, the, the product liability directive is up for review. Then there's the, the um, uh, radio equipment directive, where we basically would just need, uh, Simon pointed me to that last year <laughs> uh, on Twitter, I think. Um, we just need an implementing act by the commission to uh, set uh, minimum security standards, at least for, for radio equipped devices, which most of these devices are nowadays. Then uh, there's the, the whole system for CE marks, for product safety, you know, for your toasters and stuff like that. That could be easily expanded to also include um, IT security aspects and so on. But this is all mostly uh, product uh, regulations, internal market regulations, uh, consumer protection for s to a certain extent. Yes. But, but this is really <coughs> the angle where... They don't cover the rest of the world. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, 
good. But if we want to secure our systems, I mean, this, this is what systems sold on the EU market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you well <laughs> maybe, maybe the other ones then buy our products. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. If you start to have software liability, you can, you will automatically have more security for everyone because if you enforce having updates, oh. let's say like Android updates that are basically, you can buy nowadays, you can buy an Android phone where the last security update was two years ago. That's mm -hmm. not okay. There is also, the EU has the potential of a global spillover, you know, of uh, adopting some standards that then for the companies it's just easier to adopt them worldwide than to have different standards in EU and other markets. Um, I have a question, so I'm going to interject because we're starting <laughs> to run out of time. I would, was curious about all three of your thoughts. Um, in the US, there's this vulnerabilities equities process. I don't know if you're familiar, but basically, um, there's a process w that was originally within the executive branch whereby each agency that wanted to hold on to a vulnerability rather than disclose it, there was like an internal executive branch panel and they would note that they wanted to hold on to a vulnerability and there was a kind of balancing process as to whether or not the agency should ultimately hold on to the vulnerability or disclose it. Um, now, the Electronic Frontier Foundation did a lot of Freedom of Information Act litigation, and they brought that policy public. And now there's talk in the U.S. about actually legislating for that policy. And as part of the legislation, there's talk about expanding the panel so that you would have other voices included, so not just the agencies. Um, so of interest, I actually um, don't know the full details, but for example, you could imagine an equities process where you would even have a cert on the panel. Um, and so I was curious to know whether or not there are any similar discussions um, at the EU level about, um, you know, talking about similar processes um, and whether or not you think that that might provide some kind of um, mechanism by which um, there would be more of a balancing of the kind of security implications when governments, um, particularly with respect to unknown vulnerabilities, um, decide to hold on to them rather than disclose them. So it's, I mean, it's an interesting approach. The thing is, they also need to have, it's also really important to have like <coughs> remediation uh, actions because at some point this vulnerability has been found by, found by someone, some organization. It's going to be, it's going to go public at some point in the future. It can be like a shadow worker like leak or just some, some other research of finding it. So there is a really big problem with like having an organization like holding to that and not necessarily having a way to respond really efficiently to those kind of, uh, to just like fixing it and pushing patches or making sure that the actual like population just gets in time before it gets really bad, get in time some, some patches so they can, they can move on and like not be vulnerable for weeks and months. If I may add on the point of complexity on this, sure. uh, <laughs> I know that from the cyber intelligence market, so the providers of technologies for intelligence purposes, often there are products that are being sold that embed the exploit of a vulnerability, and the vulnerability itself is not known by the customers, mm. by the government agencies, because it's a trade secret, it's a proprietary industrial secret yes. of the provider. So the law enforcement or intelligence mm. agencies buy the capability yeah. and the functionality, but not the mm. vulnerability. Mm. That's another yeah. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any last question? Oh, go ahead, um, Rob. I'm not aware of, of any, uh, like in the in EU institutions, any uh, more detailed discussions or even proposals on, on these kind of things. Uh, the only thing that we did uh, in, I think, when was that, 2012 or so, uh, when uh, the EU revised the um, um, cybercrime directive, uh, so the criminal law directive, uh, we made sure that so-called white hat hackers who accidentally stumble into a server that hasn't been patched for six years or something and then notify the operator or the manufacturer that they don't get criminalized. Mm. But nothing further as far as I'm aware. Okay. Any last questions from the audience? I have a question to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. That's allowed. I think time is up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I okay. no, just uh, coming back to your e-evidence. <laughs>
Will that be about um, access to electronic evidence within the EU in other EU member states? Kind of an extension to the investigation order or also in third countries? Yeah, well, uh, and then only Council of Europe members, uh, convention, mm -hmm. uh, or even others. No, oh, that that is one of the aspects that is still not clear. Uh, oh, okay. There, the, the there were initial debates were covering both EU and third countries, so both. Uh, but uh, I don't. <coughs> that was just the preliminary, basically, discussions that were in the expert group uh, yeah. meetings. Uh, that that's publicly available. So not a problem if I say it, but uh, <coughs> uh, it hasn't been in the end decided yet what will be the, the territorial scope of the measure. Okay. Watch this closely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of you who've attended. Just a quick um, uh, advertisement by PI if you want to pick up one of our reports on the minimum safeguards related to government hacking. Um, we have some copies up front. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, John.